Hi everyone. Um, so this is one of those talks where I overpromised and I'm going to underdeliver. Um, I thought I would have a solution to crossing the divide from raster tiles to vector tiles by now. Um, turns out it's still really complicated. Um, okay. So quick summary on why we use vector tiles. Uh, because you can change the style whenever you want, even like in the middle of um, a user looking at stuff um, to do dy dynamic data visualizations, for instance. Um, Tile processing turns out to be a bit quicker if you're just cutting up vectors um, into little packages that's just a faster process than generating raster images using something like Mapnik. Uh, you get the benefit of being able to kind of nicely zoom in between zoom levels, 11.1, 11.2, 11.3. Um, and you know, some other benefits like um, if you only generate vector tiles up to zoom 15, you can still show them at zoom 16, 17, 18, 19. Um, whereas raster tiles would be a pixelated mess by then. Um, the constraints when we're working with vector tiles, so I'm talking really fast, I've got a lot of slides. Um, the, this first constraint turns out to be a big one. Um, if we're working in the Mapbox ecosystem, we're only allowed 500 kilobytes per, <coughs> per tile. And this is just a problem that just never really occurs in raster tiles. Like raster tiles, it's more like how much can I, uh, how much information can I visually cram into into a certain number of pixels, uh, we don't really worry about the size of the tiles so much. Whereas trying to cram all the data you need into a vector tile turns out to be a, a thing you wrestle with all the time. Um, and if you want to try and render th that data, it's got to be there, obviously. Um, and another big issue that we're constantly dealing with with um, vector tiles is it's, it's not enough to just transport the tile somewhere. You've also got to transport the style along with the tiles and make sure there's some sort of client engine at the other end that knows how to deal with my style file and make sure it applies to the, rest, the vector tiles. Um, whereas in the raster tile world, all of that stuff's really simple. You're just shipping around little pictures and everyone knows how to display a picture. Um, and you've got to choose which client you're targeting, which again is not a thing you need to do with raster tiles. Um, with raster tiles, you've generated some pictures and, and um, you don't actually even have to think at this stage whether you're using open layers, leaflet, um, I don't even know what else there is out there. Um, whereas when you're generating vector tiles and making a style for them, you've pretty much got to have already decided, am I going for Mapbox GLGS? Am I using open layers, using its um, vector tile support, which doesn't have a standard, like a name for the standard? Um, is it, am I going to try and use Leaflet, which is kind of a bit ugly? Um, or am I going down the Tangram path, which is kind of amazing. Like Tangram does some really quirky, super interesting things, um, but it's kind of a bit, less solid, and who knows what's going to happen to Tangram now that MapSend isn't around anymore. Um, and you've got to choose, of course, how you're going to generate your vector tiles. And I know nothing about generating vector tiles dynamically. My entire world is Tippecanoe, which is generating them uh, statically. GeoJSON in, MB tiles out. OK, so that's just setting the stage for the problems we're about to encounter. Oh, yes, technical challenges. OK, so here's one of the first problems, just kind of a classic one that you run into with, um, with vector tiles. So we're used to, gener uh, to wanting to display a label in the middle of each polygon. Um, typically, if we do something like you know, tile mill or um, I don't know what else you use to generate raster tiles, that's kind of easy. You've got the whole polygon. Um, it can just work out where the centroid is and, and draw it. But why do we have so many brim banks? Well, it turns out we have so many brim banks because that brim bank, that, the, the polygon of the local government area of brim bank is actually straddling six different tiles. And when the rendering is taking place, um, Mapbox GLJS in this case doesn't know that the brim bank in the bottom left um, tile is the same as the one in the bottom middle, is the same as the bottom right. And so we end up with these six different. Um, uh, labels. It's smart enough to only draw each polygon and each tile once, um, but it, it, it ends up um, uh, labeling them many more times than we actually want. So solution. Um, you really don't have a choice. You basically have to generate a separate uh, label layer. And fortunately, um, Andrew Harvey, who is around somewhere, um, has written this nice little library. So we can take our GeoJSON file, run it through GeoJSON polygon labels, and then it will spit out a, uh, a different data set of not exactly centroids, but what is it, center of mass or pole of inaccessibility, so even better than centroids. 
and that is the, the, la the layer that you're going to use to display your, la your labels with. So problem solved. At the cost of slightly more complexity, now we have two layers to deal with. Um, what? Oh, well, that shouldn't be there. Um, okay. Um, second problem you might run into is you want to display terrain. So this is a not very well displayed screenshot from my former website called cycletour.org. And it's got, obviously, terrain. And I pre-computed the hill shading with GDAL. And I um, pre-computed, um, you can use the, the slope um, calculation for a little bit of extra um, visual <coughs> niceness. And I also use color relief, which I really like. So I basically had all the low elevation as kind of green and all the really high elevation as white. And, um, and I just found that like really great for when, when you're zooming out to be able to see where are the big mountains, um, where are interesting places to go hiking or cycling for me. So how can, we do, how can we get that kind of effect in the vector tile world? Well, Mapbox's first attempt at this was generating vector hill shades. So basically what they do is they, they calculate the hill shades and then sort of reduce them all down to about four colors and then um, kind of vectorize each of those um, bits of hill shading. And I just never found it very convincing at all. I, I sort of look at it and I'm like, I, I think it's trying to tell me that there's a slope on a hill somewhere, but I, I can't even visually map that into a, an actual um, sort of 3D shape in my head. So fortunately, more recently, they've had another go at it. And this time, they've kind of given up and said, all right, we need rasters. Um, so they now have a, a, a full world raster layer of um, like a digital elevation model for the world. And they've implemented um, hill shading in the browser uh, in Mapbox GLJS. And you can actually you know, set the sun direction to any direction you want. You can change the color of the, the light and the shade, um, and you actually get a fairly decent result. The downside is there's still no color relief, so I'm still kind of sad. Um, another problem <coughs> we run into once we commit ourselves wholeheartedly to the world of vector tiles is that sometimes you still need raster tiles. They're just things that, like there's some edge case or there's some um, you know, c case where you, you actually still need them, even if it's not your, your primary use. So for instance, um, with this cycletour.org website, even though it's primarily going to be a desktop app and vector tiles going to be great, if I want to access those tiles on my mobile device um, using a tool like Maverick, I really am going to need raster tiles. So, um, whoops. Uh, so solution number one for generating those raster tiles, fortunately there is a solution, even once you've built your vector tile um, stack, is you can use this tile server GL tool from Cloak and Tech which is a, um, a Czech company which really confusingly uses a kangaroo as their logo. Has anyone else noticed that? Uh, I spoke with guys last week, funnily enough, and Clocat is kangaroo in Czech. Yeah. But they're based in Switzerland, hilarious. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually asked them the same question about it a year or two ago, but yeah. Um, anyway, so there's one of their solutions. They, they seem like a really good company, by the way. Um, and another solution, um, rather than doing it yourself, is you can actually just use either MapTiler, which is run by Cloak and Tech, or Mapbox to generate your raster tiles for you, which is something Mapbox keeps really quiet. I guess they want everyone to use their vector tiles, but when you need the raster tiles, it works perfectly. So that's actually really cool. Um, then there's this other problem that crops up, and it's kind of a bit complicated to explain, but basically, at the top, there is tile mill. If you say, I only want my roads to appear at zoom 14 and above, that's kind of the end of the story. Okay, they, they only appear at zoom 14 and above. But if you do the same thing with vector tiles, if you say, you know, I've prepared these vector tiles and now I only want my, my roads to show up at zoom 14 and above, well, you've, your roads might still be present in your vector tile data set at zoom 12. And now you're wasting data and you're probably running into those problems with too much data in your, in your tiles. And it's kind of really messy and awkward and complicated. So I have four different solutions. <laughs> Solution number one, go nuts with Tippecanoe. So if anyone's ever used Tippecanoe, you'll know it has a 1,000 options. And if you ever get your head around its conceptual model for how it calculates zoom and detail and all that kind of stuff, you're doing better than me. Um, you can kind of mess around with the zoom settings, and you'll say, OK, um, let's, let's, create, uh, let, let's have everything only from, you know, um, from zoom 14 and up. 
But that won't really work because you've got different layers and you want each layer to work independently. So the solution really is you need to go really nuts with Tipper Canoe um, and generate these crazy command lines with you know minus L you know, for each independent layer with you know, JSON passed on the command line and that's never a good thing. So actually the solution is to go absolutely nuts with Tipper Canoe. Um, and what you want to do is generate um, sometimes per feature min zoom settings. So literally every single feature in your GeoJSON file, you can stick your own individual min zoom um, flag on it. And um, yeah, this is an example of, um, of, of doing this with uh, Vic map data, trying to optimize the crap out of that, that data so that each of these layers would, would only appear in the vector tile data set for the, um, the layers where we knew that it was going to be displayed. And yeah, that file is enormous. You can really go uh, very far down that rabbit hole. Or you can give up. Um, and the other solution is you just upload the thing to Mapbox and you like, pay them or whatever, and they will optimize their vector tiles to match the style that you associated with it. Somewhere in there, there's got to be a, a cleaner way of doing this yourself, but I, I'm not aware of what it is so far. Okay, so those are just inherent kind of technical challenges that come up when you're um, trying to use vector tiles. But then, and I only had this big insight this morning, you have architectural challenges that arise because of the following kind of set of logic. Like with raster tiles, the, the, the tiles are going to be so big and so expensive to compute that pre-generating your entire tile set probably doesn't make sense, which means you're probably going to want to do it dynamically, which means you're going to need a server, and then that server can have a database and all this other stuff. Once you switch to vector tiles, you realize, well, actually, I can pre-generate all my vector tiles, and I can just upload them to some sort of vector tile host, and I can put my static front end on a different host, and I probably don't need a server anymore, which means I don't have a database, which means, oh, now I have to rethink my entire architecture. Good news, don't need a server. Bad news, don't got a server. Um, so the example of um, this that I'm going to use, um, so you understand my personal journey, crossing from raster tiles into vector tiles, is this wonderful website I built called opentrees.org, which has hmm, getting close to a million open data trees on it. I originally built this as raster tiles uh, using tile mill. Um, back in the day, oh, I still miss tile mill. A tile mill was the tool that got me into GIS and mapping. Um, sadly, it's kind of, uh, I think someone's still maybe half-heartedly maintaining it. Um, but yeah, so that's what it looked like. Um, you know, load the data into PostGIS and wrote lots of rules about how to display the data. Um, and the trees were basically always green because on the fly data visualizations aren't really a thing you can do with raster tiles. And this is kind of what it looks like now in Mapbox Studio. So before, um, like the old way was I had this server, which I was basically um, misusing a, a server that I had access to through a certain university. Um, and I had PostGIS running on it, and that meant I could put PG REST API, which is a way of interrogating PostGIS data directly through an API, and it had tile mill generating tiles on demand, and that had UTF grid, which is this really brilliant hack that um, Mapbox came up with for interacting with data, and an Nginx static front end. And eventually, more recently, I've kind of rewritten the whole thing, and now it's basically a bunch of scripts that take CSV files, spit out GeoJSON, turn those into MB tiles, I upload the list of Mapbox, and then the, the static front end lives on GitHub pages. So the brilliant thing is, no server. Really? All right. Um, anyway, quick summary. You, you don't use SQL, you write scripts. Um, and I'll leave those. Oh, you can read the rest of the, uh, the slides yourself. Okay, questions. <laughs> questions for Steve. Yes. All right, coming. Uh, thanks for the talk. So if I have a 27 gig uh, elevation data set for Australia that I want to make um, a contour service out of, uh, yeah. what would you recommend? Um, well, f personally, first I'd look at something like the Mapbox contour data set and see, see whether that was good enough for me. Um, 
Otherwise, uh, yeah, you're basically using GDAL contour, generating a gigantic file, and trying to uh, turn it into vector tiles, and then seeing whether you like the result or not. I don't know if there's a better way. The questions? By the way, this slide is all my unsolved challenges with cycletour.org. Uh, so if anyone's got answers to any of those. Oh, hi. Um, I do a lot of uh, work with uh, offline maps um, for my user base. Um, can you explain the difference between uh, vector MB tiles and then the kind of offline packages that the likes of Galileo and OSM end use? Oh, um, interesting question. I, I don't know anything about the way OSM end um, works. Um, MB tiles is the only format I know, which is basically uh, an SQLite database for, um, with a bunch of you know individual files packaged up inside it. But yeah, I actually don't know anything about. Um, you put vector tiles in an MB tiles file, though, can't you? For offline. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah and, and the MB tiles format is actually completely agnostic as to what kind of thing is inside it, whether they're, they're PNGs, GeoJSONs, TopoJSONs, MB, you know, like um, PBFs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep.